1 Corinthians 5. It's not a very long chapter, uh, but it has some very interesting things in it. Let's go ahead and pray. Father, we do thank you for all the blessings that you showered down upon us. Besides us just being overwhelmed by the understanding that you have given us salvation, uh, that you are constantly here for us and in our lives, and no matter what happens, Lord, that we take things in stride and understand that we will have difficulties here. There will be times when we need to have those hard conversations with people and even have those hard conversations with ourselves. So, Father, we pray that you would not only be here tonight, but that we would feel your presence. Lord, as we get into your word, that you would guide and teach us, direct us. Build us into the people that you want us to be. Lord, empty us out. All that you have given us, we want to give away. Father, help us to understand the purpose and the way that we're supposed to do that. Let us be there for one another in the difficult times and understanding that that's what life is all about. So we thank you again for everything, especially our Lord Jesus Christ. It is in Christ's name that we pray. And all God's people said, amen. So I'll give you a little preview. Um, sometimes I like to give these little handouts. If you didn't get the handout. Uh, okay, <laughs> you can see it. Uh, anyway, it says, <laughs> it says, when I stand before God at the end of my life, I would hope that I would not have a single bit of my talent left and could say, I used everything you gave me. I used everything you gave me. Um, you're going to see how that's going to just, on Sunday, how it's going to tie in to this whole notion and understanding of what happiness is and how we're supposed to look at it. Um, I was studying on this all morning today, and I actually had to sit back and go, wow, wow, I really learned something here. So anyway, God has a way of doing that to us, doesn't he? Absolutely. All right, let's go ahead and dive right in. Uh, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Verse 1. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and such sexual immorality as is not even named among the Gentiles that a man has his father's wife. Interest, interestingly, how he starts this whole thing out, right? He says, not only is this happening, this doesn't even happen in the secular world, but yet it's happening in the church. Let that sink in for a second. So throughout scripture, we see that God builds many things on this moral foundation, okay? Um, too many times we like to try to re redefine that moral foundation. And have you ever asked yourselves, like, where do, where do morals come to begin with, right? Uh, is it okay to, to kill? Is it okay to lie? Is it okay to, to rape? Is it okay, right? All those, all those things that we, we in our being and our soul know, no, these are wrong. Well, where did that come from? Don't you ask yourself that? Like, like, how did this come to be? Where, where did that come from? And, and do we as men have the right to then try to twist and turn those things or try to redefine those things? Because that seems to be what happens, right? We take that moral code, that moral foundation, right? And then we try to reconform it. So I just wanted to give you something that relates back to this, okay, all right? A man and his father's wife, okay? So Leviticus 18, verse 6, it says, None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him 
to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. Whenever we see that, that exclamation point, if you were, I am the Lord, what he's saying is, this is coming from me. This is coming from me. All right? Verse 7, the nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother shall not be uncovered. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife, you shall not uncover. It is your father. It is your father's nakedness. Hmm. Interesting. So now we start delving into some of the spiritual aspects of how everything is put together and how everything works. If you will, man and a woman shall be joined and become one flesh. So we're seeing that, that that's being pushed to the forefront, right? There should be some, some what here? Hi, Carol. No, you're fine. There should be what? In this, in this, in the, in this situation, all right. In this situation that we're we're talking about here, first of all, we don't do it because the Lord says don't do it, right? There should be some reverence for the relationship that you have between close relatives, right? That should be also in there too. But I think what Paul's getting to here is that this line that's being crossed here, even the Gentiles don't cross it. Even the Gentiles don't cross this line. Like, what is going on here? All right, let's go on to verse 2. He says, And you are puffed up, and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. How'd they react to this? It's interesting, right? How did they react to this? Were they doing the right thing? How, how are we supposed to look at these situations, right, as, as believers? Well, I think it's pretty straightforward when the Lord says, I am the Lord, don't do this, right? Interesting. What about this being puffed up? What does that mean? Because we'll, we'll, we, we see it in different places, being puffed up. Like, what, what does puffed up mean? Well, let's go back to 1 Corinthians 4. We just did it last week, right? Where he talks about this being puffed up also. He says, now some are puffed up as though I were not coming. You see what he's saying? But I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And I will know, not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and the spirit of gentleness? Being puffed up means putting yourself above the things that are right. Uh, you are redefining what those things are. If you will, self-righteousness would be a good way to explain this. Um, I know God says this, but I'm willing, you know, I, I think that this is okay. So now you're instituting God's understanding with your understanding or your own self-righteousness. You're being puffed up, all right? Um, this, this stuff only leads to disaster, Okay. Um, scripture tells us that pride comes before the fall, and that's exactly where this kind of attitude, this kind of demeanor, this kind of action comes from. It comes from our own pride, okay? Um, sometimes it's difficult to humble yourself uh, to what God is saying and teaching and guiding and directing. Um, you may have you mean it may not sit well with you. I mean, there's plenty of things in Scripture that, that I have difficulty with. I'm sure there's plenty of things that you guys have difficulty with, um, especially in this avenue, the sexual immorality thing. It takes many uh, facets and avenues. Um, but again, it's not about us, right? It's about us. And so... If we condone something that we that we know is wrong or we should know is wrong, then 
where's that leave others that look in there, right? Yes. Drunken slump. Yes, that's exactly right, Paul. This is the same. This is the same nakedness that's being. It's something that's being exposed that should not be exposed, or something that's being done which should not be done, right? That that that's that's exactly the same. It's exactly the same term. Yes. Um, interesting that when we see this, um, it it always has this air about it, right? Doesn't it? It just. It just always has this air about it. And I think that's where Paul's going with this whole thing. He's saying, come on, believers. Not only is this happening, this doesn't even happen in the Gentile world, but now it's happening within the, the confines of the church walls. Like, what are you guys thinking? What are you guys thinking? Let's go back into our text now. We're in verse 3. Verse 3. For I indeed, as absent in the body, but present in the spirit, have already judged, as though I were present, him who has done this deed. Paul said there is no wiggle room here. There's no gray area, right? Because that's what we like to talk about sometimes, right? Oh, well, you know, there's, you can interpret it a little bit different. And maybe it's a little gray area. We can, listen, we will, we will disagree on lots of things that are in Scripture. There's just no doubt about it. Um, this is not one of them. Okay. Hey, Jack. Hey, Jack. Hey, John. This is not one of them. All right. Um, there, there are things that you can, you know, that are not essential items that you can, you know, have some different areas of movement and stuff. Uh, this, this thing, this sexual immorality that Paul's talking about here, this is not one of them. Okay, this is this is not one of them. And so, uh, you know, I always tell people this is like, okay, uh, you know, the best you can hope for with somebody uh, as far as scripture understanding and all that is 80 to maybe 90% at the most, all right? There's always going to be things that we're not always going to, but the first 50% we both have to be in agreement with 60%. We got to be in agreement with that. Jesus is God. You know, he died for our sins. Uh, salvation is only through him. No other name. You know, uh, all those essential items, right? Um, those things you cannot disagree with because it's another faith then. It's not our faith. And so, but but other things, you know, you can... You, you know, you see it a little bit like this. I see it a little bit like that. You know, it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, that's that's not an issue. That's not this one. That's not one of those things. There, there is no gray here. Um, no gray area. So he's saying, it's pretty clear to me, right? Verse 3. It's pretty clear what's going on here. It's pretty clear what's going on here. And... Uh, I think it's refreshing when I see um, Christians, people, believers, uh, when they say, you know, this is this is pretty straightforward. This is pretty clear. Verse four, in the name, remember what he says. I've already the man who's done this deed. This is already you know handwriting's on the wall here. Verse four, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you are gathered together along with my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying, listen, you, you know the kind of guy that I was. You know, he says, I, I'm always there with you in spirit. He says, just and, and because we're all supposed to be following the same rules and regulations and understanding and, and, and commandments and you know, and because we're all tied together, we, we are of what? How did Paul put it? We are of one mind. All right, uh, Ephesians four: the unity of the Spirit. Right, where there's one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one Savior. All those things are essentials that cannot be moved. He says, so we are on this. We should be on the same page. Well, when you, when you start allowing things like this in that degrade the body as a whole, the, the body of Christ as a whole. He goes, that has to be addressed. That has to be addressed. Verse 5, 
He says, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved in the day of our Lord Jesus. He's not saying this guy, how do I put this? All right. Sometimes, sometimes people, you have to turn them over to what they're doing in order for them to come back to their senses, right? You ever seen anybody that's just really just off on a tangent, they're off on a binge, they're off doing whatever. Sometimes you gotta let them hit bottom, right? Before they wake up. The problem was there was no accountability going on here. They were still a part of the church. They were probably big givers to the church maybe, right? And so they let a lot of stuff slide. Um, you know, it's like if you go into a church and you have somebody who's caught, let's say, I don't know, um, messing around on their wife or their husband or something, right? and then they're in ministry work, what, what's the first thing that happens? They get set down. They, you, have to get, you have to set those, those folks down from the ministry work. You can't, you can't have that. They got to be above, above reproach, right? That's, there's no accountability happening here. They're, they're actually condoning what's going on here. They're condoning it. And we can't have that, right? If there's one thing I want you guys to understand about, you know, who we are and what our faith is and everything that happens there, is like, I expect you to be accountable to one another. It's not for me to only, you know, I'm not here, you know, with a magnifying glass. I expect you to, to work on each other when you're together. Say, hey, let's, we're supposed to be working on that foul language. Hey, we're, we're, you know, we shouldn't be talking that way. Hey, we shouldn't be doing that. That's just not, it's not just for when I'm around. That's what Paul's trying to tell him. Even though I'm not here in the, in the body, I'm here in spirit. That's what he means. You don't just do, do the right thing when somebody's around. You do the right thing all the time because God's always around. God's always around. That's what he's called us to do. All right, let's go over to Job. All right, let's go over to Job real fast. Job 1, verse 9. It says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has and on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. What did God say about Job? Have you considered my servant? He called him a servant, right? Satan didn't like it. Why? Because God was what? Blessing him. God was blessing him. See, that's what God wants to do. We walk close with him. We walk, we walk the way we're supposed to. Guess what God wants to do? Bless you. He wants to overwhelm you with blessings. Let's go over to Luke twenty two thirty one. He says, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for you, this is Jesus speaking, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Mm, interesting. What is, he what is he telling Peter here? Peter, you're going to go through some stuff. Your, your faith is going to be tested. Satan's asked to put you through the ringer, just like he does all of us. The important part is a couple understandings. Number one, Satan asked. That means you can't just do it. It has to come through God first. And I know it's hard to understand sometimes. Everything comes through God's hands. Otherwise, he's not God. What does he say? I prayed that your faith should not fail that you would keep going keep moving forward understand all that and then he says this at the end and when you have returned to me meaning what there's going to be a time when you when you walked away interesting he says when you come back to me and i and i take this as when he denied christ three times and then when he came back and jesus asked him three separate times, do you love me, do you love me, do you love me? He says, when you have returned to me. He didn't say if. 
And see, that's 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 the important part too, isn't it? It's not if he was going to return. He says when. So believers can never be pushed away. They may not walk with God arm in arm at all times. He says, but when you return to me, when we get back connected, when we're closer, he goes, I want you to what? Strengthen your brethren. Tell them what you went through. Give them your testimony. Explain to them what's happening, right? In your heart and your, and your spirit, because it will help them in the same way that we do. Everything that we go through, I lost a brother, right? My, you know, I, this happened to me. I was, you know, abused here. Uh, you know, all those things work hand in hand. All those things work hand in hand. It's very interesting the way everything works together. Verse 6, verse 6. Let's go back into our text. Verse 6. Your glorying is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Amen, Paul. Amen. Understand what Paul's getting at here. What he's telling them is this. You let a little bit in, it usually infects all of it, right? And that's the way he, he's, he's talking about leaven here. You know how leaven works, right? You put it in the, the, the bread and the dough, all thing, the whole thing blows up. And so it contaminates everything. So the things that we let into our lives that do not belong there, they don't just stay in that little little part. They start eroding the other parts of our of our spirit and our soul and the way that we act and the way that we think and the way that we do things and that's the important part it's the way we think the way we focus the way we the lens in which we look at life through it leavens a whole lump be careful be careful those little things are actually big things you blow them off and and you know Let's go over to Galatians 5, verse 7, where he tells the Galatians, this is what he says, you ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? What did he tell them? You started out great. What happened? This is, this is, this is the classic walk of the Christian. We come to the Lord. We're on fire we get that rush, that, that, that adrenaline and emotional-filled uh, rush. And then life comes at us a little while later, right? I think it's part of our maturing that we, will, that we have struggles within our walk. I, I believe that's the way God has determined this should be. Uh, you know, you will be tested, you will be tried. Uh, temptation will come, you will have trouble. All those things. And, and as a matter of fact, if we look at that verse in Luke where, where Jesus is talking to Peter and he's saying, you know, you're, you're going to go through some stuff. He said, but you will come back. You will, you will get through it, right? Your faith will be renewed. You will be, you'll be better for it in the long run. And I, and I believe that's exactly what happened. Peter was better for it in the long run. And then he was able to strengthen others, just like that verse tells, tells us. He was able to strengthen others because of what he went through. In the same way, we do, right? Same thing with us. Now, verse 7. Therefore, purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are truly, since you truly are unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sanctified for us. Sanctified means to be separated from, right? Anytime we see any kind that says sanctified, uh, even when we see the word holy, um, most instances in the Bible, what that holy means, it means to, to be separated from for a purpose, okay? Being sanctified or being pulled out of the crowd, if you will, for a purpose, all right? That's what being sanctified, and it's through Christ that all that happens, okay? Verse 8, therefore... Let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. He's using the Passover celebration. He's using this whole understanding to try to get through to them. He's saying, your hearts are in the wrong place. 
you're letting this stuff in it doesn't belong here it's causing damage not only to you but to the body as a whole and if you will the people that are doing it because if boundaries are not set then what happens what are we telling those people it's okay to do that and guess what they will continue to do it right if there's no pushback you will not change if, if there's no correction that comes from God you will stay the same as you started right so accountability works in God's purpose there I always like to put it like this there's, there's purpose in the pain there's purpose in the pain so let's look at Isaiah 53 one of the most you know famous scriptures it's it's misused a lot but let's look at it and he says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shearers is silent so he opened not his mouth it's interesting you ever see this happening when they when they shear the sheep it's very cool they don't really they don't they don't make any, hardly any noise and uh it's interesting so he was oppressed he was afflicted he opened out his mouth verse 8 he was taken from prison and from judgment and who will declare his generation for he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of my people he was stricken it's God talking here right see that's that's why we're here that's why we're called that's why Peter calls us a holy priesthood a holy nation or holy again to be separated from to be for a purpose right if you look up that root uh, understanding of, of of holy in the Hebrew that's what it means it means separated for a purpose now sincerity and truth right don't let other things you know get in there and, and again what did he talk about? Being puffed up, right? So when we let the wrong things in, we get puffed up with wrong ideas. We get puffed up with bad attitude. We get puffed up with things that we shouldn't be doing, right? It's okay. God loves me. He'll forgive me. That's usually our blanket, right? God loves me. He'll forgive me. Verse 9, back in our text here, verse 9. He says, I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual sexually immoral people he says we've already talked about this why well scripture tells us uh, it was a proverbs that says that bad habits corrupt good uh show me your friends i'll show you your future should not the church should not the church peter talks about this he says shouldn't judgment in the church come first shouldn't the church be showing the world how it should act instead of the world showing the church how it should act? It's interesting, right? Sounds all right. Sounds right to me. I think that's the way it should be. The, the, the church should change the world, not the world change the church. Some people forget about that, right? They want to twist and turn God's, God's word. Well, I have an issue with that. Listen, we all have issues. That's what scripture's for to iron out our issues. I'm going to take you ahead a little bit in the next chapter because he's going to he's going to follow this up again, right? He's going to follow after this. He's he's talking about this sexual immorality and he's going to follow this up with it with another issue. Let's read about it. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 14. He says, "Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers what's he mean by that that means we don't hang around unbelievers of course not of course not but if that's all you're around that could be a problem okay do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers that should not be your whole existence you should have a church family you should go to church you should go to functions you should serve you should be around believers and yes unbelievers also because unbelievers cannot become believers unless they're around a good example 
too often though, it's like we're Christians on an island. We're all by ourselves, totally inundated with unbelievers all the way around us. And we think that we can stand in that situation. That is just not, it's not true. We won't. We will not stand. We will cave. Do not be unevenly yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? And what accord has Christ with Baal? Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. See what he's saying? So he's tying it together. Listen, I'm all about, man, be around people. Talk about Jesus. Be there for people. Believers or unbelievers. I have no problem with that. But your foundational strength comes from a group of believers, whether it's online, whether it's at a uh, physical church, whether it's in a food bank, whether, you know, serving, whatever, whatever it may be. You have to have that spiritual strengthening in order to do God's work. You have to. You have to have this, what we're doing right now. We, we talk about God's word. We get in there, we read his word, we get discernment, we get understanding. I love that, what he says. And what agreement has the temple of God with idols? None. What fellowship with righteousness has with lawlessness? They're complete opposite. How about light and darkness? Couldn't be further away from each other on the spectrum. Let's go back into our text now. We're in verse 10. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral people of this world or with the covetous or the extortioners or the idolaters. Since then, you would need to go out of the world. See what he's saying here? I've already wrote and written to you about this. Be careful with the people that you that you keep in your circle, right? I'm not saying you won't go out and have interaction with those people, but the people in your circle, your innermost group, should be strong believers. Verse 11. But now I have written to you not to keep company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral sexually immoral he's talking about believers here he's talking about a believer here who has lost their way and what does he say about it hold them accountable hold them accountable and he doesn't just talk about sexual immorality here look what he says here verse 11 go back in there he says with anybody named a brother who is sexually immoral, or covetedness, or an idolater, or a reveler, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, or not even to eat with such a person. Listen, it's pretty obvious to us when we're with people, even in a very short period of time, who they are, right? We like to say, I see their heart. I see their attitude. I see I see who they are down deep, right? Um, it's pretty easy to see that. It really is. And so what Paul is saying here is, is look, listen, if, you know, there's some underlying issue that we're not being made aware of here. There's some reason why they let this go on in the church. There's something happening here. Either they were big givers or they were like, have some influence or they, um, there was there was something else going on here, and, and he, we don't get that information. But I can guarantee you, if this was just Joe Schmo, you know, sitting in the back aisle, oh, they would have railroaded him out of there so quick. But th that's not what was happening here, All right? So he's what he's doing is he's saying this isn't just about this one issue; it's about the issues as a whole that these things don't belong in church and it should not happen and because it degrades it degrades the church as a whole and then other people come in and they see this right so people come into the church and they see this you know the way they treat 
someone who's in the clique, who has the, you know, money, uh, who's, you know, who has prestige or something, um, when they fully know this is wrong, this shouldn't be happening, you know, this doesn't belong in church, um, it just gives the church a black eye, right? Um, we don't, that's why we should be very careful, especially as believers, of the people that we endorse, support, and put forth. Because they should be ambassadors of Christ, as we are ambassadors of Christ. And they should speak for the Lord. And if they're not, as we see here, they're actually doing damage to the faith. They're actually doing damage to the faith. All right, verse 12. Verse 12. For what have I to do with judging those also who are outside? Do you not judge those who are inside? He says, you know better. You know better than this. Verse 13. But those who are outside, God judges. Therefore, put away from yourselves the evil person. It is up to the church. It's up to the church to make sure they are policing their own. Otherwise, right? What happens? The church gets pussed up. It starts letting in all this bad leaven. It exposes the congregation to these things. People walk away from the church. Hypocrites. Look, they let them get away with it. They tell, right? Let's go over to end our study tonight with John 17. All right? Love John 17. It's a prayer. The whole chapter is a prayer from God the Son to God the Father. Uh, gives us so much insight and understanding about how things work together and where Jesus' heart is. And uh, I love it. I love it. Sometimes I'll just go in there and just read the chapter because it, it just it does such a wonder for your spirit and your soul. All right, verse 14. John 17, verse 14. He says, I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world. Again, church should teach the world, not the world, the church. He says, just as I am not of the world, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I also send them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they may be sanctified by the truth. Thank you, Lord. Separated for a purpose. Jesus sends us into the world to be good examples, to love our, our, our God, to love ourselves, to love others, and to show people that life is great, and it's a gift, and it's what we should just absolutely thank God every day for. I think, Louie, you say this all the time. You know, God woke me up today. Thank you, Lord. It's a gift, man. It's all a gift. Let's not trample on the gift. And I think we're going to talk about this on Sunday. We're going to talk about how happiness actually works into this whole equation of faith, God, what he's given us, you know, the, the, the things that he's blessed us with. It's an amazing understanding. All right. Make sure you guys are here on Sunday. Um, uh, we are doing John, I forget where we are. John 12. I think we're starting 12. Yes. We're starting 12. All right. Well, thank you all for for tuning in. We had a great study tonight. I will see you guys on Sunday morning. God bless you. Uh, we will be doing communion on Sunday. So go ahead and get your elements ready, the juice and the cracker. And then uh, we do it at the end. And we'll, we do it a little differently. But if you just have your elements there, and we'll bless those elements before we do it. And, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to Sunday. It's going to be a great day. So let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for all that you've given us tonight. We thank you for that you continue to always bless us and that you're always here for us. And We shouldn't take any of this for granted. And 
Father, we do thank you so much that we can come together to love one another, to be there for one another in the best way that we can. Lord, help us to, to just have a clean heart, clean hands. Let us put off those things that keep us from you and let us understand how much you love us and show that love to others. Father, we thank you again for this time and this night. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Before we go, I just want real fast, um, I just want to throw this out there for you. Our brother John is having surgery tomorrow. John, Jackie, we love you. We're with you. Um, you know, I hope everything goes great. Uh, best possible outcome, brother. Uh, let's go ahead and pray for John. We'll throw John in there. Father, we'd ask that you be with John as he goes through this surgery tomorrow, Lord, that uh, you would just give expertise to those surgeons, Lord, that he would have the best possible outcome with as little pain as possible, Lord, that he would come back onto your on his feet so that he may work for you. Father, we know his heart. We know that he loves you. And Lord, be with him and calm his spirit through this whole thing. Let him be a testament of what it means to know you and to love you, and to have you in his heart. We love you, John. Take care. Father, we thank you now. It is in Christ's name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen, Amen.